All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we are so excited to be sharing um, our perspectives on what's been happening in the crypto markets over the past month, as well as peering into the future, and then having a little dialogue with some UK-based founders of cryptocurrency companies. So welcome to the blockchain.com uh, July Market Outlook. My name is Nicholas Carey. I'll be your host today. Um, I am the co-founder and vice chairman of blockchain.com. I was the author of The Future is Decentralized and the founding commissioner of the Blockchain Commission for Sustainable Development. We're really excited to have you with us today. So a little bit about blockchain.com. Uh, we've been around for quite a while now, almost a decade, and we're one of the most widely adopted cryptocurrency wallets. Um, that's kind of what we're predominantly known for. But we've raised around $500 million to build some really good products uh, for crypto curious um, community members. So number one is a wallet. This is a venue that you can go to to send, receive, secure, trade, and exchange digital forms of wealth. And if you're a retail customer, we highly recommend that. Um, we've had about 74 million signups and in any day now we'll be able to announce the 75th one, which is a pretty exciting milestone for the team. About uh, two years ago, we launched the blockchain.com exchange. This is a professional trading venue uh, with deep liquidity and very, very um, great features for the more uh, savvy traders out there. And we would welcome uh, you to sign up for that. The blockchain.com explorer was the very first product we ever built. Um, this is a great place for statisticians and nerds that wanna look at what's happening on chain. And we'll be pulling some data from that uh, to talk about the health of the Bitcoin blockchain specifically at the latter half of this presentation. We also have some features that enable things like borrowing, buying simply, and even earning interest on your crypto if you uh, want to do that. So a lot of different products and services at the blockchain.com platform, and we'd welcome anyone to explore those and let us know if there's anything we can do better. Okay, um, the team has been really busy over the past month, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about a few things that we shift across uh, the blockchain.com experience. Uh, number one, for uh, people that have been uh, asking for this for a long time, SegWit is finally live in the blockchain.com wallet. We've seen the percentage of addresses spike um, adopting uh, the SegWit um, uh, scheme for addresses. That's been a widely requested feature for quite some time, and we're very happy to finally have that live. Um, it helps save space on the blockchain and decreases um, transactional costs, among a variety of other features um, we hope to enable with it in the future. We also launched BitClout, a really interesting um, new crypto asset you can test out. It is a um, fully decentralized social media platform and a really interesting product. Highly encourage people to go check out uh, that platform. And if you want to support it, you can also buy Clout on the blockchain.com exchange. We've launched uh, instant USD uh, Euro in GDP transfers between the wallet and exchanges and uh, made that a little bit faster. We've also improved the swap experience by reducing the time it takes to execute trades. Um, we've increased the number of interest bearing assets to include Aave and Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi. So if you hold either of those and you wanna earn some interest on those, um, you can do that at blockchain.com. And then uh, if you haven't noticed it, there's a simple buy widget on the Explorer to encourage first time users uh, to test out buying Bitcoin. They can do that within two or three minutes using a credit card or bank details. We launched interest on Android, um, a better uh, checkout flow um, for simple trading on the blockchain.com exchange. And then uh, finally, we've uh, integrated with Unstoppable Domains, uh, which is enabling a new kind of format uh, that makes it a little bit easier for people to send and receive crypto um, using a unique, uh, basically, URL. So lots happening and uh, pretty proud of the team. We also launched a brand new uh, homepage to blockchain.com, um, something we uh, hope to be a little more approachable um, for the next generation of crypto curious. Uh, so very proud of that. And then um, we're publishing our interest rates uh, for deposits um, onto the blockchain.com interest feature. So if you're holding any of these cryptos and want some of that uh, to come back to you, um, there's minimum uh, transfer amounts, but it's a really great way to have your crypto work for you while you sleep. Okay, uh, just a friendly reminder, the exchange has uh, been updated as well. So there's always new features launching there. Um, and last time uh, we did our Outlook, our on-chain insights, and we had our special guest, Muni Bali, who's the founder and uh, CEO of Stacks um, and now Hero, which is a, a development uh, firm specifically for the Stacks platform, talking about how um, we can build smart contracts that are secured by the Bitcoin blockchain. So you can find that on YouTube uh, and also um, on Spotify and our other podcast venues if you didn't catch it. So today, um, again, we'll be looking at what happened over the past 30 days, looking at some on-chain insights, but really we're going to be getting to our special conversation with two really exciting founders of UK-based uh, tech um, and crypto startups. So we'll be very pleased to welcome uh, Tom and Itamar uh, in just a little bit. So 
stay tuned um, for that part of the presentation today as we have a deep dive into what these guys are working on. I'll introduce them uh, just at the end here, but Mark and Itamar will be joining us. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Jason Karch, um, who will be doing this month's Market Outlook. Jason? Hey, folks. Really, really excited to be stepping in for Garrett Heilman, who usually talks about the market and makes commentary. But it was a fairly choppy slash sideways month in June and into this month, July. We, we saw price action kind of go sideways. It looks like ETH has slightly outperformed some of the other large cap cryptos, but at a very high level, everything's just kind of waiting in a waiting phase to some degree. I think one of the things that a lot of, a lot of investors are looking at are, is the macro environment, which has seen gold and USD stay flattish, even as the Fed has become a little bit more hawkish although uh, their posturing is indicating a transitory uh, in inflation environment. However, today's inflation numbers in the US at least have signaled that there may actually be a warming of inflation, uh, which sort of counteracts the deflation narrative or the transitory narrative and actually might be somewhat bullish for crypto. The markets in crypto remain focused on the grayscale GBTC sort of unlocking of underlying uh, BTC, which currently is trading at a negative 15% uh, unpremium, I guess you could call it, which historically has always been at a premium. And that has spooked some folks into thinking that this might affect the market a lot. But we believe the impact at a very high level will be muted in the next two weeks, because what we're seeing is 50K BTC, not 50K dollars, but 50K Bitcoin are, are coming uh, unlocked but there's already been over 500,000 Bitcoin unlocked. And so we think that there will be muted, uh, it'll, be, it'll be muted in terms of uh, the impact. If we look at open, uh, open interest in, uh, in futures, there's, it's sort of cooling down. Um, in dollar terms, it's low. In, in Bitcoin terms, it's low. And it's really signaling that the market is deleveraged. There's, there's just less and less speculation and more consolidation at this phase. Another chart we like to look at is the sort of on-chain estimated cost basis to the current market value. And if you look at these peaks, that's essentially when Bitcoins that are sitting in wallets are sitting on a lot of gain. Uh, you can see even at some points, almost six, almost over seven X the gains, at least before 2012. But right now it's cooled off down to a reasonable 1.7 X for the average wallet. And so we think that we've sort of formed a solid base that could be a good moment to either see an uptrend in, in buying, um, but we'll, we'll have to kind of monitor this over time. I think another thing we like to look at, obviously coming from blockchain.com are the on-chain insights. And there's not a huge story here that's not already been talked about. So in terms of number of transactions and payments down 13, 16%, uh, what's interesting is blockchain.com's share of transactions and payments throughout the entire network have, have increased. We historically had about a third of all Bitcoin net network transactions happen via blockchain.com wallets. And we've seen that sort of uptick uh, kind of coupled with the fact that we've released SegWit to all wallets uh, have kind of had an interesting impact on the daily uh, transaction fee per transaction. So you've seen that go down 60%, which I don't think we can 100% claim uh, that it's it's due to blockchain to come releasing SegWit, but it certainly had some impact along with the market cooling down. And there's also a, a fewer daily active addresses. What I'm sort of skipping over, but I think we can kind of dive into a little bit deeper later on is the well-documented decrease in hash rate based on the, the sort of minor crackdown in China. I think there's a lot to be said there and we can kind of dive into that in, in the future. But that's a general look at the last month and a half. And I'd love to then turn it back to Nick to introduce our UK Founders Panel. Thank you, Jason. So uh, today we're joined by uh, two special guests, um, Itamar Le Suisse, who is the co-founder and CEO of Argent or Argent. Um, Itamar was previously the co-founder and CEO of Peak, uh, the leading mobile brain training uh, platform with over 60 million users uh, that was acquired by Lagarde in 2016 uh, prior to Peak. He worked at Visa, Amazon, and BCG. Um, Tom Robinson is uh, one of the oldest founders of a crypto company that I know um, and the co-founder of Elliptic, 
uh, .co, um, uh, which provides compliance tools for crypto businesses and financial institutions. Elliptic pioneered a field of blockchain analytics and blockchain archaeology, basically building the first products uh, to allow exchanges to screen crypto transactions for risk and meet their regulatory obligations. Uh, Tom leads a team of researchers that investigate the illicit use of crypto and also engages with regulators around the world. He holds a doctorate in physics uh, from the University of Oxford and uh, someone I regularly seek advice from. So uh, Tom, it's great to have you back. Thanks for having me, Nick. Great to be here. Okay, so um, we have a little tradition here, so I get to monopolize the first question. Um, and uh, we always like to find out how our guests earned their first pound, dollar, or euro. And so I'll start with uh, Itamar, but how did you get into business in the first place? What was your, when you were a young entrepreneur, how did you earn your first uh, euro, pound, or buck? I think it would depend the scale of it. Probably my first, uh, first earnings were just selling a copy of food vouchers at school. Uh, so that was not, uh, maybe that's closer to crypto. Uh, so printing some money, uh, then probably building computers. Um, that was probably my, my first internship, a bit more legit. <laughs> that sounds pretty legit. That's good. Tom, how'd you earn your first pound? Um, so it was it in crypto, but it wasn't running a blockchain analytics company. It was actually doing crypto custody. So when we first started Elliptic, um, the problem we, we looked to solve was how to provide secure, insured uh, storage of Bitcoin. Um, and so we managed to get insurance from a, an underwriter in London um, and we offered, yeah, insured Bitcoin storage as a service. That was the, the first source of revenue for us. Awesome. Um, okay, well, I'm going to kick off with um, kind of a quick conversation, and I think let's see how, uh, how it goes. Um, Itamar, what is your vision for Argent? And, um, you know, you've kind of been a real leader in the Ethereum community, building tools that a lot of people are actually using. Um, I think that's one of the key drivers of your company's success. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you guys saw that opportunity and, um, yeah, what your, what your vision is for the wall platform you guys are building? Sure. So... The, the bet we make we're making at our gen is really we, we're, we're seeing it we see ethereum like the net, next chapter of the web so we are really making the bet that an open permissionless platform will outper, outperform legacy finance there'll be uh, more innovation more engineers working on on hot problems and that will like the web create a lot of innovation so from that perspective, we thought, okay, Ethereum will become this settlement layer for the entire world. Finance will run on those rails uh, beyond speculation. So real needs, real issues, real uh, products solving real problems for users. Therefore, they need a way to access that, that world. It needs to be non-custodial. And that future for us cannot exist if it relies on every user holding some kind of secret, such as if they lose that secret, they lost all their funds. If someone has that secret, uh, they have all their funds. Uh, we don't believe at, at scale mainstream will work that way with some post-its and their seed phrase. And so we started really by solving that. Uh, where we are heading, we are building Revolut without the bank. Uh, so we have solved first recovery and custody in a non-custodial way. Uh, we are putting our fraud monitoring on chain. So in our gen, you can differentiate low risk and high risk uh, transaction, make it super easy, the same way your bank would do, and then giving access to all of DeFi is obviously what what's the end game uh, on what we've done a lot of work and we, we surfed on that way for a while. Igmar also has one of the most beautiful user experiences in the space, which he didn't say out loud, but I would like to <laughs> say out loud. We, we make security easy. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, Tom, walk us through the transition between starting off um, Elliptic as a custody platform um, to then transitioning and you know, really taking a leading position in this blockchain archaeology, blockchain research, and analytics compliance space. Um, walk us through how you, got, how you guys did that. Yeah, so I guess I first heard about Bitcoin in 2012, and I started talking to all of my university friends about it, and we got really fascinated by the technology. And eventually decided to quit our jobs and, and start a crypto company. Um, but at that point, we had no idea what exactly we wanted to do or what problem we wanted to solve in the crypto world. Um, but eventually, we, we, you know, the first step was crypto custody. And that was because the big problem we saw was people losing their, their Bitcoin. Um, you know, there was that famous case of James Howells, who 
stored 7,000 Bitcoins on a hard drive and threw it away by accident. And it's currently apparently in some rubbish tip in Wales. Um, and we thought, well, this shouldn't be happening really. There should be protection available to people who would be willing to pay for it through insurance. And so we launched that product. And we had a focus really on institutional clients. So we wanted to be storing crypto for banks, asset managers, hedge funds. Um, the problem was in 2014, none of those types of entity were really interested in crypto. And the main issue they had with crypto was the perceived link to um, financial crime. You know, most people just thought about the Silk Road when they heard about Bitcoin. Um, a lot of it was just generated by inaccurate media coverage, but there was a kernel of truth there. And so we thought about how we could leverage the transparency of the blockchain to overcome this problem, um, i.e. Through, through blockchain analytics. And so we started talking to some of the biggest exchanges operating at that time um, about what kind of blockchain analytics products we could provide them with that would help them to um, meet their regulatory obligations and detect whether they were receiving um, proceeds of criminal activity. And so we, we created that first product in about six months, launched it. It was immediately pretty successful. And we've just been building on, the, on those products since then, really. Um, Itamar, what is like the most requested feature from your users right now? Um, for us, for years, it felt like everyone wanted SegWit, but it was like probably a smaller uh, percentage of very uh, vocal community members that were um, looking for that feature set. And now we get a lot of um, other things people are looking for. But um, I'm curious, uh, you know, you guys are really concentrated on, you know, as a gateway to Ethereum and DeFi. You know, what are other things people are looking for? Um, you know, and can you give us a glimpse into what uh, what might the future hold for the next uh, three to six months on the product roadmap? Anything you could reveal? Sure. Yeah, I think the it's quite quite obvious, and our users are quite vocal. Uh, scalability layer two is really the most requested feature. Uh, if you look at Argent journey, we are we are there to make crypto useful and mainstream. Um, but we started on Ethereum layer one, very expensive. Uh, we abstracted everything except the fact that everything is expensive. Uh, and so uh, we have users now that holds millions of dollars in their wallet. That's not mainstream. Uh, you want users that have $100, $200. So in September, we are launching uh, on, on ZK Rollup with ZK Sync. That means we are decreasing costs by a factor of 50 to 100. And then you really have a mainstream product. You end up with a Revolut, a cash app that is fully global permissionless. Yep, transaction fees have been a constant irritation and barrier to adoption in our space. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. I'll give Jason an opportunity to ask a question here momentarily, but um, so I have a question for Tom. Tom, you, you guys have been involved in some of the most um, prolific, I would say like cyber investigations uh, the last few years uncovering um, and supporting law enforcement efforts uh, to protect consumers. I'd love to hear like, what is your, what are you most proud of as a founder? Um, one of the stories you can tell if any of them um, where you guys really felt like uh, you made a big difference and um, would love to hear you talk about uh, that story to the extent you can share anything about it. Sure. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we're constantly doing research into illicit use of crypto, um, uncovering new illicit actors, new dotnet markets, new ransomware strains. So some of the things we've looked at recently are, for example, the dark side uh, ransomware. Um, so uh, one of the most well-known victims of that, rans that ransomware was Colonial Pipeline, which um, runs a lot of the infrastructure in the US for distributing um, gas, basically petrol. And they were hit with a, 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 a malware attack um, asked to pay a large ransom, um, which they did. Um, but the work we did was to analyze those ransom payments in order to build up an understanding of the wallet infrastructure that this ransomware group um, were using. And that's really important because um, if you don't have that, then it makes it very difficult for law enforcement to follow the money and work out who's behind this and potentially seize the funds. Um, but actually probably what I'm, most proud of is using that kind of insight to warn crypto businesses if they are receiving those types of proceeds of crime. Um, you know, our, our 
real mission as a company is to protect crypto businesses and help them grow and thrive and make crypto accessible to as many people as possible. And if they're going to do that effectively, then they need to be um, protected from this type of criminal activity and they need to be able to comply with um, you know, financial services regulations. So although you know, we do a lot of research into criminal activity, which leads to it potentially being um, halted and taken down, actually probably what I'm most proud of is protecting the crypto industry itself through, through our products. And actually, Tom, that's a good segue into sort of my line of question here, which is we've seen a lot of uh, you know, delays from the FCA on, on applications in, in, uh, for crypto businesses in the UK. We've seen increased calls for regulations on crypto businesses or stable coins in the US. It seems like it's sort of posturing in reaction to the pipeline ransomware uh, or in response to Circle uh, filing to go public with the SPAC merger. Um, when you think about the, the regulatory environment, like what's, what's your take on our regulators coming to you and asking for data? Do you feel like there's a data-driven process? Where, where, where are you seeing this going? Yeah, so regulators are coming to us for data, including the Financial Action Task Force, who are basically the, the organizing body for regulators around the world. So I think they are taking a sensible approach to this. They're starting to. Um, and I think a lot of the, the new regulation that's coming up, part of it is just catching up with traditional finance. And part of it is introducing crypto specific regulation. And I think in that latter group, I think potentially regulators are starting to go too far. I think that it's perfectly reasonable that a crypto business should be subject to the same regulations as a, a bank or a money remittance business, but I don't think it should really go beyond that. And so we're doing a lot of work lobbying regulators to to sort of limit uh, and prevent any kind of regulatory overreach. And I guess uh, switching gears for each of our, uh, since I know we're kind of bouncing around topics, but uh, one, of, one of the things that we hear a lot from users is, uh, you know, the increased energy surrounding other chains like Solana um, or layer two bridges to, to other trading. How do you sort of think about Argent's uh, evolution to support, you know, uh, layer two scaling methods? I'm thinking like Polygonmatic or other chains that are, are starting to see some energy in terms of, of building. Yeah, so the, we actually, uh, you know, I think there are a few different camps when it comes to energy. Uh, I think in the team, we are actually very, um, uh, very concerned uh, about that uh, and very sensitive to that issue. So our sc scalability is really the key for that. I think for us, we see two steps. There is layer two. Um, I won't go into our definition layer two, but our focus is really into rollups rather than side chains. Uh, so maintaining a fair security and finality, uh, which is why we're starting with, with ZK rollup and ZK Sing, and then we'll expand to others. And that alone has a drastic impact. You could. I mean, it's not one-on-one -on -one, uh, decrease in fee equal decrease in carbon footprint, but it's quite close. So we're talking several order of magnitude of, de of uh, decrease in terms of um, energy consumption. And then the next step will be on Ethereum itself, moving from proof of, proof of work for, to proof of stake. Then you have a system that is scalable and that is, I would say, that has a negligible carbon footprint uh, compared to any, um, any you know, uh, technical web uh, or software activity. Uh, so actually, I think it's coming much, much. It's much closer than people think. For us, layer two comes this year. Uh, then what we are calling the East to merge it could come as early as this year or early uh, next year. So I would say in a year from now, uh, carbon carbon footprint will not be an issue anymore uh, for Ethereum-based uh, applications. Well, speaking of that footprint, and actually, Nick, since uh, you didn't necessarily expect me to ask you a question here, uh, that, that sort of leads into the blockchain.com is historically very Bitcoin centric in its user base. And, uh, you know, it, obviously the history sort of started around the start of Bitcoin. How, how do you think uh, blockchain.com needs to evolve uh, with, with, you know, the, these, uh, w whether it's just for carbon footprint or meeting users where they are currently active? How, how do you sort of think about that? 
Yeah, this is an active conversation we're having both uh, within the community, within the leadership team, and then it's obviously in the public discourse right now, which is um, it feels like the earth is, you know, hurting and uh, the science is becoming much more crystallized that, um, you know, anthropo like humans are basically causing the earth to warm up. You know, um, I think there's a special opportunity, though, with crypto um, because we now have a transparent system uh, for looking at how humans trade wealth um, in a, on a global context. And we can actually price um, everything because of its transparency. We've never had that mechanism before. So it allows us one to shine light on it, which is the first step toward really understanding the scope of the total energy consumption and also the cost of basically building trust between individuals in a globally digital economy. Um, I do think there's uh, going to be differentiation across cryptos that decide to go um, down a greener path. And uh, the interesting thing is that consumers will still have a choice. Um, they'll be able to choose cryptos that um, clearly have a lower carbon footprint. And then there are others um, that may uh, trade off uh, security features that some people still see as more valuable. And so at the end of the day, I think um, our position uh, as a firm will evolve primarily based on user feedback. And we are very open to hearing that feedback and would welcome um, you know, uh, messages sent to us on our social channels. Let us know what you're thinking too, um, because ultimately we all uh, have a responsibility to, to leave this planet hopefully in a better place than we inherited it. And the reality is the financial system of yesteryear is tremendously destructive. Um, you know, not just uh, on a social level, but actually in an environmental context. You know, if you think about the total energy needed to build Canary Wharf or Wall Street, the strip mining of the earth, the rare earth minerals that are, um, you know, uh, taken out of the earth's crust and stored in vaults hidden behind guys with guns, a lot of it is sort of silly. Um, and so, you know, if we were to reimagine how to build uh, money for uh, a new uh, economy, one that's predominantly based on the internet, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons there's so much interest in crypto generally is we're actually able to have that conversation now. And almost all of the uh, founders of cryptocurrency companies are really pioneering um, this new relationship between people's social consensus of what money really is. And so that's one of the things that makes this work so interesting is that if you actually care about, um, you know, access to financial services for everybody in the world um, and inclusive um, access, then you can get into that with crypto. If you really care about tooling a greener economy for the future, there's a seat at the table for you too in crypto. And um, there's also a seat if you care about um, all kinds of other issues. And so it's a really big tent and we need to marshal the passions of everybody that cares about things to come in and help us build a, a better financial future for everybody. And I think part of that um, includes leaving a smaller carbon footprint. So that's my personal view. Um, and ultimately I think consumers still get the choice with the you know, we support a lot of different assets, including some that are moving to these uh, much more uh, scalable, um, from at least from an environmental damaging perspective, um, like the Ethereum upgrades this summer, keeping a keen eye on, and I'm very supportive of personally. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's okay for a payment system to use energy, right? You know, as, as Nick mentioned, traditional payment systems also use huge amounts of energy. I think what's important is, that that energy use is proportionate to the value that a given payment system brings um, and relative to other payment systems. Um, and also I think we shouldn't necessarily focus too much on what's happening now, but what the potential of things like Bitcoin are. So in the future when Bitcoin is potentially serving orders of magnitude, more people, um, what does the power usage per transaction or per user look like at that point? Um, so yeah. Tom, when, when you think about uh, sort of uh, the future of, of Bitcoin and, and, and these other chains and, and the analytics that, uh, that you're sort of applying your company to, what, what do, you, do, do, you, do you think the focus will continue to be on, uh, on Bitcoin when it comes to security and safety? Or do you think uh, it's going to sort of, are, the needs will expand? Um, it's, it's difficult to say, isn't it? I mean, what I can say is that if we look at um, the types of queries that our customers make, the vast majority, you know, over 95% are still on Bitcoin. Um, and I don't necessarily see that shifting hugely anytime soon. You know, we already support over 100 different assets um, and that's expanding all the time. Um, 
Yeah, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think one of the interesting things is going to be how layer two solutions pan out. Is Lightning going to get um, significant adoption? Um, because that represents a big challenge in terms of blockchain analytics. If you're no longer recording every transaction on the blockchain, then how, for example, as a regulated um, institution or, or crypto business, do you determine source of funds? What you can see is it's appeared out of the Lightning Network. You can't see, for example, whether it originally came from a ransomware operator or a .NET, .NET marketplace. Um, and I don't think there's going to be a blockchain analytic solution to that. I, I think there might be um, a regulatory solution to that. Is it the same story for DeFi and all the money flowing into these smart contracts? Um, probably the opposite, actually, in that there's way more visibility there. So at the moment, from a blockchain analytics point of view, if we see um, a, a centralized crypto exchange, that's a dead end. We can't follow the flow of funds through um, a, a centralized exchange, but we can follow the, the flow of funds through a decentralized exchange because the the, the record of the exchange from one asset to another is there for you to see on the blockchain. So actually, DEXs are, from our point of view, are great because they provide way more um, visibility. And I think that might be good news in terms of regulation of DeFi as well. I don't think there is as much need to impose regulatory obligations on decentralized exchanges as there is on a centralized exchange. Yeah, interesting. As, as usual, when there's a black box, we need to see what's happening in there to understand that the market isn't being manipulated and consumers are being protected. Right. Um, that's a good argument. Um, so uh, one of the questions that came in uh, from the side here. So um, it seems like a lot of firms are hiring right now. Um, and so uh, talk to us both about, you know, what kind of talent are you guys looking for? Um, you know, Itamar, uh, are you hiring just in the UK, around the world? Uh, Tom, same question to you, but I'll go to Itamar first. Um, yeah, what does it take to work for a crypto company and what kind of people are you guys looking for? So, yes, we're hiring uh, from, from the very early days of Arden. I mean, from day one, we've been a remote company. So be, before the whole pandemic, uh, but we've been hiring only in Europe, uh, our definition of Europe. So we are very, very generous definition that includes the UK. Uh, Ukraine and Russia, uh, but so it's it's a remote company on on the very small range, uh, limited time zone range. It's been working very well, and it's been our culture from day one. Spending every three months, spending a week together, the entire team uh, somewhere in Europe. So uh, a very strong team culture. We see each other a lot, but at the same time, a lot of freedom. Uh, we are ring across all our positions. I think historically we've been. Uh, across all engineering position, we require, I think, uh, like a, a lot of crypto companies, the bar is quite high in terms of knowledge uh, of cryptography, for example. Uh, Arjun is quite uh, deep in the stack for a wallet. We're not just a, a typical wallet. It's a private key or UI, and, and that's it. I mean, it's relatively simple. We are really reinventing a new model to custody, to secure your assets. In a, still in a non-custodial way using smart contracts. So we go deeper in the value chain. So we have solidity engineers, front end engineers, we have a back-end infrastructure, and we require everyone in the team to have, a, a, I would say, a certain knowledge of cryptography, understanding of security. That's been historically the core team. Um, now we're expanding, we are uh, a bit more flexible. We want deeper knowledge in other areas. So UX is super important. People who have great knowledge of that. Uh, uh, a lot of the work we'll be doing on our infrastructure around fraud monitoring is, you could argue, similar to what's being done in the traditional system, company like Stripe, et cetera. Um, so uh, being more flexible there, but strong engineering background is always welcome. On the safety side, we see more self self-made people, which we like a lot too. Uh, so people who have a passion for crypto and, and, and have learned in the past two years, uh, you know, to code on this new platform. Um, yeah, so I would say what we need more, most is, you know, competency and, and passion like many companies. Thanks. Tom? Yeah, so Elliptic is hiring in pretty much every part of our business right now. Um, you know, what's limiting us as a business today is having the right talent rather than demand. And so, you know, we're looking for people in engineering, data science, finance, strategy, ops, 
and maybe a bit different to, to Itamar. So we don't necessarily need any crypto experience or expertise. We want people who are um, experts in their particular area of, of competency, so finance or ops or whatever. Um, we think that you can learn the, the crypto specific stuff on the job. Um, you don't need to have that, that existing knowledge. Um, we're increasingly seeing a lot of applicants who come from traditional finance um, backgrounds, which is really positive to us because they're the types of clients we're selling to. And I think it's important that we have that kind of viewpoint and experience um, in-house as well. Just to add, what we are what we are looking for is often not crypto experience, but cryptography, so proper uh, cryptography experience, and be able right. to con understand those concepts. Actually, a lot, a majority of our team doesn't have any crypto experience. Uh, so, just to clarify, it's very hard to find people with crypto experience. It's like entry level job with ten years <laughs> experience. Like <laughs> it, it, exactly, it's, it's so exists. new. So yeah, cool. Um, Jason, I'd uh, defer to you and maybe get one or two more questions in and then uh, button it up here. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the, the questions that are coming in the Q&A seem to be focused on where the future of the market is going. Um, <laughs> so we can skip those questions. Uh, <laughs> although presumably everyone here is bullish on the growth uh, that we're seeing in terms of just the sheer number of, of users. When you think about growing your business, what are what are the... What are the key areas of investment for, for your business growth? And I guess, Tom, we can start with you. Key areas of growth. I mean, going back to hiring, we just need more people. Like there's so much to do in, the, in this industry and in this market, and there's so much demand. We just need to build more stuff. Um, so yeah, hiring is the big challenge. Um, when we think about expanding our products, it is things like adding you know, asset support, um, for more assets, it's about getting deeper into DeFi. You know, we think DeFi is here to stay and is going to be incredibly important. Um, we see other use cases of blockchain analytics beyond sort of anti-money laundering. Like increasingly, businesses are wanting to do things like market intelligence, business insights through blockchain intelligence. And so, that yeah, there's just so much to build. Edomar, how about you? How about Arjun's growth? Where, where do you see the need for investment there? So in, in some way, very similar. So hiring, uh, big priority, where, where it's quite different, we're a much smaller team. So we a lot of hiring, obviously, on the engineering team, not only from the existing product, but a lot of R&D initiatives. But we also have to build almost new, new teams from scratch. We've been now, our go-to-market, our marketing team is, is very small. We haven't done much go-to-market work. Um, and all, all our energy was focused on R&D and, and then shipping layer two and scalability. And now that we have a, soon a product that is free available anywhere in the world, so we have to switch gear when it comes to, to go-to-market. So there will be interesting positions, available, uh, hiring positions at Arjun. We can do plugs at the end for your career pages for both of you. It sounds like that's a key area of need. But uh, actually, a question that I think our audience often loves to hear is uh, sort of when you think about recommending books or your, your top three pieces of content, could be non-books, but books is where sort of I'd love your head to go. What, what would you recommend that people read? It could be about, it could just be something that you read for fun, but uh, also about business, about crypto, about cryptography. Interesting. Nick, uh, sorry, I, would, I would, a chance to think. rather than a book, I would say, like, if you haven't been on the dark web on some of these marketplaces, have a look. Like, obviously, don't buy anything, but just take a look. It's an amazing kind of subculture that is, yeah, just fascinating. Like, what kind of things you can buy, like the forums, the marketplaces, the vendor shops. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. So just have a, have a browse. So on man on crypto, something some people may be surprised with a, a blog I refer often. If you want very relatively clear, simply simple to understand uh, content, is actually Vitalik. 
uh, blog. So I've had a lot of questions on layer two, uh, people mixing what we call layer two, side chains, roll up, et cetera. V Vitalik is a really good post that it's quite accessible. Uh, and so there are a few topics like that where it's both quite accessible. So I would suggest that to people who really want to understand, um, especially layer two, which is a big topic this summer for, for everyone. Yeah, that's a great one. And then there's some strong um, conversations happening in GitHub. Uh, and also you can find nuggets um, in some smaller Reddit communities. And if you have the time to scroll through Twitter, there are some people that are doing some, um, I think, thoughtful uh, contributions there, but it is a lot of noise too. So um, I would like to thank uh, Itamar and Tom. It's first of all, great to catch up with you guys. Um, so I'm always cheering uh, on the sidelines for both you guys. and. Uh, Hopefully when uh, we can get back together in person in the UK, which we're, uh, looks like we may be able to in the next month or so, it'd be great to, to host uh, something in person again. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers, everyone.